Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I'd like to welcome you to our 22nd livecast. Thank you for taking the time to be with us as we continue our sweep through the continent to bring you updates on the progress of the African identity authorities through our Eye on Africa segment. This has been a really interesting journey, which we conclude for 2021 with two more countries today, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. These two differ from the six countries we previously covered in several details, including the fact that they are both financing their projects through public-private partnerships. We have the two director generals with us who will be sharing some fresh and pertinent insights from their experiences. Today, we're going to structure this livecast very differently from our previous episodes. There will be no opening remarks. Instead, I will come back after the regular features to give you a bonus presentation that summarizes the key lessons that we have learned from the eight country reports. You would not want to miss this executive summary, so stick around. Also, if you're attending live, you will be able to download the presentation from the chat at the end. It has lots of useful material, analysis, and recommendations. Before we start, I have two quick announcements to make. First, as always, I'd like to thank our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for their continued support of our live guests. Second, I'd like to update you on our call for speakers on the dark side of identity. The submission deadline has passed, and we have received an overwhelming number of proposals. In fact, so much so that we are now dedicating not one, but three episodes to the topic as follows. In the first two live casts, uh, November 17 and December 1st, we will talk about specific risks and mit mitigation through responsible policy and operations. This will be a lineup of representatives of NGOs, civil society, academics, development organizations. In the third episode, we will have industry representatives who will talk about mitigation by design. We are in the process of completing the due diligence and constituting the final panels. We will announce the panels successively in the weeks to come. Please stay tuned. This is a very important topic, and we want to give a voice to as many points of view as possible in order to allow for a meaningful and responsible dialogue. Okay, now let me welcome our distinguished panelists. With us today are Dr. Alan Gelb, who is a senior fellow from the Center for Global Development, Professor Kenneth Atafua, the Executive Secretary of the National Identification Authority in Ghana, Mr. Setioni Kafana, the DG of ONESI, or the Identity Authority in the Cote d'Ivoire. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for being with us. We really appreciate you taking the time to generously share your insights and experiences with our audience. We will start um, with a two point to the point segment. Um, with Alan and I talking about biometric authentication and the challenges in the field, followed by the Ghana report and then the Cote d'Ivoire report. Then I'll come back at the end to give you the key lessons learned from the eight identity authority reports, as I had just mentioned. Okay, now we're ready to kick back, to kick off with the to the point segment for this session. Thank you, Alan. Welcome. Um, you, you're somebody who doesn't need an introduction. You've been with us for a while, but I think our community is growing. So I want to just say a few words about where you come from. Um, Alan is a senior uh, fellow at the Center for Global Development. Um, he spent a significant part of his career at the World Bank. Uh, currently at the uh, Center for Global Development, he leads the digital identity and biometrics and uh, uh, practice. Uh, he's a developmental economist, and he has been with ID for Africa as an advisory board member since inception. So, Alan, thank you very much for taking the time today. I know you're busy. You've got a lot of things going on, so we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. So, I want to start um, today. You and I are going to talk about a subject that um, you've been working on for a while. It's authentication in, in the field. Uh, who have you been working on this topic with? Actually, Joseph, this uh, has been work with Julia Clark. Um, Julia has worked, Julia and I have worked together for quite a long time, as you know, 
Right. And it turned out we were both looking at the, the same set of issues. So we thought we'd come together and uh, put, our, put our work together. So what I'm going to describe is joint work. Okay, so Julia Clark, just for those who don't know, she's from the World Bank. That's right, yes. Okay, excellent. So wh why do you think this topic has become now very, very important? And why is it of, of interest? Yeah. Well, Joseph, as we know, a lot of countries have um, begun to develop uh, ID systems. They've increased enrollments. Um, uh, you know, they're beginning to use these systems in a more comprehensive way than before. But in not all of them has the ecosystem for authentication been rolled out fully. So the systems are there, but they're often not being used in a, in a full sense. But we're now beginning to have some evidence of what happens when the systems are used for authentication for service delivery, for example, for cash transfers or for uh, food programs or you know, other kinds of things. And so this is a trend that we think is going to continue happening because once the systems are built, the systems are going to be used. Right. So it seemed important to understand what happens when these systems are used. Now, Alan, before, before we develop this point further, um, what is the value of authentication within the development agenda? I mean, we have seen the value yeah. of identification because it eliminates duplicate, duplications yeah. and therefore there will be one entitlement per person. Um, and, and so what is the value of authentication in the development agenda? Well, Joseph, um, let me give you an example. Uh, let's suppose uh, you have a transfer program or a food program and uh, you don't have a system where the delivery is authenticated at the point of delivery. You then don't know who is getting those parcels. You don't know whether the food is being diverted, for example, whether the, uh, the officials, the agents along the delivery chain maybe taking a lot of it for themselves. For example, if they're passbooks, sometimes people will give their passbooks to the agent and the agent signs for them and diverts their food, for example. So this is a very good way of keeping a tight system for the delivery of services. It's also very important, for example, for health, if you want to know who the patient is so that you can ensure continuity of treatment. So it has a variety of uses. You don't need it all the time, but it can be very useful. Now, when we talk about authentication in the development agenda, do you see biometric authentication as the preferred channel, or do you think um, there are other alternatives to biometric authentication that could also work effectively? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, Joseph, there are many alternatives. Um, you know, uh, some systems use PINs, for example, or passwords or um, uh, other forms like a one-time password. And there hasn't been all that much research on the efficiency of those systems. Let me start off by saying that, that biometrics is one of a number of options. We're looking here at biometrics, but the other systems have issues too. For example, there are some studies on PINs which suggest that a certain proportion of the population is not really able to remember PINs, mm -hmm. certainly not to remember PINs that are complex enough to provide any kind of um, protection. Also, in some societies, it is very difficult to avoid the sharing of PINs, right? So when we look at this issue, we must look at it in the context of a whole variety of other authentication methods and not just assume that there are perfect ones out there because they're not. Yeah. So in, in your opinion, biometrics is just one uh, of yes. several options that should be considered. Uh, presumably biometrics might excel in the, in the convenience department if they are easy to use. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, this is an attractive option for several reasons. People don't need to carry around a pin in their heads or, a, you know, a special card. Um, uh, the, uh, the characteristic is unchanging, which is a liability as well as an asset. Uh, it can be very fast. It can be very effective. Right. And of course, it, it's also something that it's impossible to delegate to somebody else. Right. But when we talk about authentication and in your study, have you made a, a distinction between authentication at a point of service that is atten attended 
versus authentication at self-service. All of the cases that we have been looking at have been authentication, which is attended. Uh, it's either been an agent or uh, we have not been looking, for example, at things like selfies. Self-service. Okay. No. Understand. Now, wonderful. So we understand that authentication is part of the identity ecosystem. Once we have an identity, we need to link it to service delivery, service delivery for it to become effective in terms of ensuring that the entitled people are the ones who are really getting it. You need to add a layer of authentication. So we buy now, what is the problem? Is there a downside to the use of biometric authentication in service delivery? Yes, uh, like any other form of authentication, um, there can be failures, there can be errors. Mm -hmm. And biometrics is a bit unusual in that the matching is statistical. It is not deterministic because as you know, every taking of a biometric image can be slightly different. Mm -hmm. So whereas you can match a pin exactly, you cannot match a biometric image exactly. So and because what, of that, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And because of that, there are some particular types of errors that come up with biometrics. What type of errors are we talking about? I, I know you have, you yeah. have an exhibit. Yeah, um, well. Operator, put up the exhibit, please. <clears throat> well, basically, uh, there are three kinds of basic errors here, um, mm -hmm. Joseph. Um, we have the failure to capture that the biometric sample at the point of service can't be captured. Uh, and there can be various contributing factors to it. The equipment, a variety of environmental factors, the operator situation, the, uh, the condition of the fingerprint or the iris itself, for example, um, a false non-match or a false reject rate which is that uh, the right biometric is declared to be not the match, where it should be a match, and there are similar kinds of issues causing it. And then finally, the false accept rate, which is when there is an imposter, and the imposter is wrongly matched to the subject. And that one is the fraud case. Okay, so these are sort of standard definitions outside the context of any use cases. This is not the development yeah. agenda, et cetera. So what do these things translate into when we take these errors into the development context? Um, yeah. Walk us through. Uh, operator, put up the other exhibit. Yeah, Joseph, in practice, we measure something very different. Right. Uh, we don't know how many of the people uh, whose biometrics are being taken are in fact imposters. So we cannot really uh, measure false reject rates. We can only measure reject rates. And if we look at authentication failures, we can have by the various biometric authentication failures. We can also have other authentication failures. We can have other things that have nothing to do with, with biometrics. We can have operator error. We can have error by the user. We can have a system error. Or we can have authorization failures where the person is authenticated for a transaction, but not authorized because, for example, they may not be on a beneficiary list. From the viewpoint of the person, it's a failure for whatever reason. But the reasons for the failure can be really quite different. Okay. So basically, um, why is this a difficult subject? I mean, it has not been really studied in the past. I can, I can attest to that because I know within the industry, yeah. most of the studies have been in the lab. So why has this been a difficult subject, Alan? Operator, bring Alan on the yeah. screen. When we, um, when we started uh, looking at this, Joseph, we hadn't realized how difficult it would be right. to get information on this. And there are quite a number of reasons, it turned out, why uh, this is difficult. Um, the first reason, of course, is, as I said, uh, when we get a non-match, we don't know whether that's an imposter or the correct person. And that puts some limits in the field on what we can say about the accuracy of the technology. There are very few independent studies. And this is partly because some of the technology is proprietary. 
And the lab studies, as you mentioned, there are lab studies on several technologies, on fingerprint, face, iris, but these are very different from actually studies in the field. They use different galleries, different populations. Uh, the conditions are different. They're much more controlled. The operators are trained. And so they don't generalize. And then it turns out that um, there are so many contextual factors uh, that uh, affect the performance that the same technology can differ very substantially across countries and even across cases within the same country. And the reporting is also not standardized. Some cases that we have, some studies, show that um, they, they look at failures after one attempt. Others look at failures after three attempts. And these are very, very different. So this is quite a complex area. Okay. It's complex, but very, very important to set realistic expectations. So, but you managed to look at uh, a certain number, I, I believe, yeah. over a dozen cases. Yeah. Uh, Want to walk us through what, what you've been uh, finding from these cases? Yeah, um, Joseph, we have uh, looked at uh, 14 different studies. Uh, there's actually a bit more than 14 cases because some of the cases look at several studies. Some of the studies look at different cases, but there are 14 studies that we've looked at. Most, they all come from South Asia, uh, mostly from India, because the ADA has been looked at very extensively, but also some from Pakistan and uh, one from Bangladesh. I think you have, you have prepared for us an exhibit. Maybe we, we, we have, we have, yes. So operator, please put the exhibit while Alan continues. Sorry, Alan, continue. Please. Yeah, yeah. So um, this would be the first, um, uh, the first half of the uh, set of studies. Uh, many of them are, are relating to ADA, and they include proof of concept studies that were done uh, during the time that ADA was being developed and formulated. Mm -hmm. uh, they include pension studies, uh, pension delivery in various states, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, the uh, public di distribution system, which is a food ration system that has been looked at in a number of cases, um, uh, looked, uh, studies in Rajasthan. We ourselves have done studies in Rajasthan and in uh, Krishna, a district in Andhra Pradesh, and so on. So this is the first set. And uh, if you like, we can go to the second set. Second set, please, yeah. Operator. Yeah, yeah. 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 Here is a second set. Um, uh, some of them look at business correspondent transactions, which is a cash out of social grants at the point of services. There's a very interesting set of studies on fertilizers, uh, which has been done in rounds, successive rounds. So we can see how biometric performance changes at the beginning and later on during a program as the system gains experience with them. Yeah. Um, and so on. And um, there have also been studies in Pakistan looking at the Benazir program and in Bangladesh looking at EKYC. So okay. this is quite a wide range of studies. So, to my knowledge, this is really the first time anybody has <laughs> gone out and compiled and tried to do a comparative study across all the public data that's available uh, out there. Um, yes. So, there's, it's important that we point that out. This is a, this is a valuable um, piece of work that you're giving to the community because, as you can see, this is really fragmented in terms of the results being all over the place. Um, so... Since in the interest of time, perhaps you can walk us through what were the things that caught your eye in, in, in comparing these studies and what were your findings and conclusions in that? Okay. Uh, Remove the slide, so bring Alan on. Yeah. Okay, Joseph, we, we could go into a great deal of detail on this. Every study actually is unique and the way in which the measurement is done is different and each has its own lessons. But let me just try and pick out a few uh, overarching points that come to me when I look at the studies. The first is just the range of results. At the low end, um, we see that the failure to capture and the match rates, of, uh, match failure rates for fingerprints. In other words, what you could consider as the failures for fingerprint authentication can be as low as 2%. So there are sometimes 2%, sometimes 3 sometimes 4 depending. But they can be a lot higher. And some of the estimates at the upper end are several times higher than this. So there's quite a wide spread. 
And these field results are, can be very different from the laboratory results. And other studies that we don't talk about done on one-to-end matching find that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, the immediate reaction, uh, were you surprised? We had seen examples of these high authentication failure rates reported for some time. So, you know, we've been looking at these data for a while. This wasn't, but we have been surprised by some of them. Uh, not that they're high, but they're as, that they're as high as they are reported. So I would say, yes, we have been quite surprised by some of this. Okay. What um, else? Uh, another point is that uh, leading you on that the use of multimodal biometrics can certainly reduce errors, uh, whether they are used as a fused or whether they're used in backup, one backing up the other. So if the fingerprints don't work, you try iris. If the iris doesn't work, maybe you try face. One of the studies we looked at in Andhra Pradesh does exactly that. It has a system of backups and the failure rates uh, are very, very low. Alan, so, someone asking about a backup for the biometric being a pin. What if, has there been anybody who used the pin as a backup? Use your biometric, fine, but if you get rejected, you give a pin. Is that something that has been explored to your knowledge? I don't think that in any of the cases that we've looked at, we've seen systematic backups using pins. I could look back at that, but I don't think so. Would you think it's a good idea? Because in a way, you know, it's convenient. You have the biometrics. Yes. Forget yes. I, I think it would be a good idea. You know, Joseph, what you realize is that the value of biometrics is that they take a lot of the cases off the table very quickly. Right. So if you can get 95% of them correctly done through biometrics, the number of people you need to deal with is much smaller. Right. So then you can use pins. You can use personal attestations from village officials. Uh, right. You can use, for example, a system of, um, of face recognition done locally as a way of confirming. Right. So absolutely, that's exactly what you need to do. And has any of the studies used voice biometric? We have a question uh, from somebody uh, from there asking, has there been any voice? Most unfortunately, no. Uh, we have not come across a study using voice biometrics. I would love to see okay. some data on the efficacy of voice biometrics. In, in the development context? Even. In the development context, yes. Okay, so so what else have you, have you uh, uncovered? Yeah, the second thing is, what are the factors that lead to the variation in performance? And... Um, the contextual factors, obviously there are technology factors, but there are also contextual factors. And these include the training and the experience of the operators, uh, the incentives. Uh, it seems that when people on both sides have better incentives to get it right, it works better. Mm -hmm. uh, connectivity, if you're doing remote, uh, remote authentication, uh, you can be timed out if con connectivity is poor. Right, that's not strictly a biometric failure, but it's a failure of the authentication system using biometrics. There are certain populations who have it much harder older people, manual workers, very young people. So that makes a difference too. Um, and in some cases, there may be power relationships that are rather important. When you do a survey of the population and you ask them, Did your biometrics fail? they may say yes. But it could be that operators are taking advantage of them, saying that their biometrics failed and then taking their, uh, their benefits. So that's also possible. Right. Um, one, one thing that, that we, we, you and I know could be an important factor in determining the failure rates or the error rates of biometrics is the quality of the sample uh, that yes. you as you know, people said garbage in, garbage out. You can't yeah. expect biometrics to perform if you're not controlling how the quality is. Uh, we have one, one question from the audience is basically saying, has there been any studies that, has, that have examined the systematic difference between um, NIST predicted performance, basically based on image quality being tracked, and the real world performance based on, on what happens in the field? So... Has there been any, any attention being paid to image quality? Um, 
I think certainly you're right that image quality is a very important question. And by the way, that can also be the image quality in the central database, which you right. are comparing to. Yes. Right. And um, if I remember right, in the early stages, in the pilot study of BISP in Pakistan, there were uh, some women who were told to go back and redo their fingerprints in the central system. Because when it turned out that the central system was going to be used to authenticate them, that the authentication failed because of the quality of the image in the original system. Right. So, that really is yeah. easier because at the enrollment yes. time, you've got kits, enrollment kits that have yes. image quality modules that try to even tell the operator what to do. That's right. But the question is, when you have an authentication yeah. device, how feasible is it for uh, the authentication device to have an image quality module? Maybe somebody from yeah. the technology side could well, share with us their insights and well, they want to come on board. Well, I, I think it would be very advisable to do that, actually, because you would short circuit a lot of these problems if right. you had that, certainly. Um, right. And by the way, again, it may not be the technology, it may be the operators. The operators. It may be the way the technology is being used. Right. Now, Alan, um, we are where we are. We know authentication is very important. We know there are errors in the field. I'm very surprised how high they are. They have real consequences in terms of rejection, exclusion. Uh, so what kind of policy recommendations or implications we could be making, knowing that this is work in progress and knowing that we're still early in this process, what can we do to help the authorities improve given the reality of biometrics authentication? Yeah. Um, Joseph, there are a few things that I think we can draw from this study. Again, it's preliminary and uh, there's much more we could say. But the first is, I think it's very important to assess the level of assurance of identity at the point of service for any particular program. One needs to understand why one is authenticating and what the consequences are. What are the benefits? To the system, to the fit, to the to the cost of the budget, and maybe to the um, person itself. Authentication can be very good for individuals because it gives them control over their own entitlements, but also what are the potential drawbacks. Right. So we need to do a proper assessment of that. And we need to think about the range of possible options. Biometrics is one, there may be others as well. So we need to have an assessment. We certainly need to pilot test early on. Um, uh, sometimes we think that these systems are not being pilot tested properly on the kinds of populations that they're going to have to deal with. If they're going to be dealing with old people or poor rural people, those are the populations they need to be tested on because their performance can differ. And uh, it would be very advisable to have those tests independently done um, and perhaps as part of the procurement arrangements for the systems themselves. Um, and then you can understand, for example, what is the benefit of having a, a check on the image quality in the equipment? Is it worth it? What are the consequences? Right. Uh, the third point is very important. And that is that the exception handling systems are actually part of the system. They're yes. not an add-on. This is very important. And that maybe they are one of the first things you need to think about is when my system fails, because it is going to fail, what am I going to do, right? Some of the systems we've looked at, some of the cases have had very good exception handling mechanisms, others have not. And there's a large difference in terms of actually denial of service. Uh, in this. So we have good examples there as well. Um, you can use multimodal biometrics, but in the end, it seems that you have to have human intervention as a final option hopefully on a very, very small number of people, yeah. which makes it a lot easier. You, you save resources. Right. And the last is you do need to monitor performance. We know that performance can improve. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that when you monitor the uh, clients, the customers, they will tell you what they think. And we know from our own surveys that people are very pragmatic. If the system improves their performance, if it gives them their entitlements, if it isn't too much of a hassle, they will approve of it and they like it. And there's a lot of evidence on that where it works well. Um, but we would also argue for some kind of standard classification so that we can understand better what is failing, uh, where the problems are, 
Is it the biometrics? Is it the connectivity? Is it something else? And one of the things we're doing is based on some studies, we're presenting a proposed standard classification of errors. Excellent. Alan, let's get to the point. Um, do you recommend at the end of the day, having seen the state of biometrics education, are you in a position to say, yes, we recommend with reserve, with reserve um, biometric authentication, or you think we are still too early in the deployment of biometric authentication? Uh, Joseph, let me go back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, each case will be different, and there may be some services for which a high level of authentication is necessary, and there may be others where it is not. What we can say from looking at the cases we've, we've seen is that there are certainly some benefits. We can see benefits, and these benefits come out, for example, if you look at the state of ADAR reports, which are very, very large-scale surveys. And they, generally speaking, show support for this technology among the people who are served because they feel it gives them better control over their own entitlements. And it's convenient. So, so it's, con it's convenient, but also it gives them more confidence that they are getting what they're supposed to get. Against that, though, one has to point out that there will be some people who this will create difficulties for. Right. And we have to deal with these people. There is no reason why authentication failures, biometric authentication failures, should lead to the denial of service. Yes. There are plenty of ways to back that up. The systems need to do that. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Alan, we've ran out of time. We thank you very much. And I will close this segment by saying, if anybody uh, has data that wants to share Absolutely. the study that Dr. Gelb is doing, pass by us. We will be happy to connect you. Um, this would be a wonderful collaboration. Alan, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Joseph. A pleasure. Thank you. Uh, now we're ready to continue um, with the second segment, which is Eye on Africa with uh, the Ghana report. Um, we're pleased to have with us Professor Kenneth Atafua, who is the Executive Secretary of the National Identity Authority of Ghana. Operator, please bring Professor Atafua. Once again, Professor, welcome. Thank you for being with us. The stage is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Yes. Well, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to share with you Ghana's national identification system, uh, provide an overview of what it is that we've been doing in Ghana with respect to uh, our drive towards digitalization. The vision of the National Identification Authority is to provide a complete value added, integrated and multi-sectoral and multi-purpose national identity system. We are to do so through the innovative use and application of information and communication technology to facilitate the social, economic, and political development of Ghana. So the Ghana Card um, project, the mandate of the National Identification Authority is to create, maintain, and provide and promote the use of national identification, national identity cards in order to provide and in order to advance economic, political, and social activities in the country. Specifically, we are enjoined to register all Ghanaians living in Ghana and abroad, as well as foreign nationals resident permanently in Ghana onto a national identity register. It is our second object. It's our second object is to issue citizens and eligible foreigners with national identity cards that we commonly call Ghana cards. So would you kindly move to the next slide for me, please? And to the next. And to the next, please. Yeah, and finally the next one. 
the less, yes. So the third mandate of the National Identification Authority is to create and maintain an electronic national ID database. We are in the fourth place also to ensure the accuracy, integrity, confidentiality, and security of the data that we collect. And finally, we are to make data in our custody available to persons and institutions authorized by law to access the data. Next, please. Ghana's national identification system provides a secure biometric register with a verification system. The national identification system can track and trace all transactions and return accurate and up-to-date information on each individual in record time. It provides a single source of truth for the verification of persons. The Ghana card is uniquely, it, it, the Ghana card uniquely identifies the bearer based on biometric features. It can be used for the verification and authentication of the identity of an individual. Next slide, please. We find it necessary to share with you the position of the registration process in Ghana as at the period before 2017 and the period at the moment, 2021. The National Education Authority had been established way back in 2006 and had started mass registration of Ghanaians in 2008. As at February 2017, the total number of Ghanaians registered onto the National Identity Database was 4,554,528. Four and a total of 2,719,425 cards had been printed. And out of that number, only 900,000 had been issued to Ghanaians. You fast forward to 2021. We now have a total of 15 million 663,585 people registered onto the National Identity Database. Of the number, 15,564,490 cards have been printed and 14,056,768 cards have been issued to Ghanaians. It is important to point out that the card that was issued before 2017 was a two-dimensional barcode card with four, that captured four fingerprints and had a two kilobytes storage capacity and no tracking number system. Today, the card that we have rolled out and issued to Ghanaians is a dual interface smart card that embodies the 10 fingerprints that were captured, has a 20, 128, storage space and a tracking number. The Ghana card has important and interesting features. Next slide, please. First, the Ghana card is based on a comprehensive database that captures biometrics, citizenship, the addresses of the applicants and their ages, and has an integration and harmonization capacity with other databases. Second, the Ghana card is secure and has very high level encryption, digital certificates, public key infrastructure, and biometrics. Third, the Ghana card meets the highest global standards in that it is contact and contactless smart card with 148 kilobyte memory chip as well as um, secure printing that meets the highest global standards of the International Civil Aviation Organization and the National Institute and Techno National Institute for Te uh, Standards and Technology uh, that is NIST, and it also has open standards. Fourth, the Ghana card is unique. 
And it employs a biometric verification system that is fast, accurate, and not limited by geography. Fifth, the card is auditable. It has the capability to track and trace all transactions and return accurate and up-to-date information on the status of each individual, including voting transactions. Sixth, and finally, the Ghana card constitutes a single source of truth in identity management in Ghana. It is the single truth anchor for the verification of persons in this country. How did we get here? Next slide, please. The roadmap for achieving the kinds of excellence that I've been talking about consisted in the performance of several key activities. In order to ensure the effective implementation of the National Identification System project, it was necessary that we embark on various activities that were um, undertaken before the commencement of the nationwide mass registration exercise on 29th April 2019. First, we had to transfer the back end technical system from the technical partners of NIA, that is Identity Management Systems to Limited, to a secure government of Ghana facility. We then transferred the public key infrastructure of the National Education System to NITA, the state's identity management authority, a, a, a technical system. Then we had to launch the first phase of the Ghana card on the 15th of September, 2017. We then redesigned the national identity system architecture to issue smart and dual interface cards. We also upgraded the hard and software components of the NIA's data bearing assets. We got parliament to pass the National Identity Register Amendment Act 2017, and we also got a parliament to pass the National Identity Register Amendment Regulations 2018 to give effect to the parent law. We upgraded NIA's tier two data center to an ultramodern tier three data center. We also negotiated with ECOWAS, that is the Economic Community of West African States, for the integration of the Ghana card with the identity card approved by the ECOWAS heads of states and governments. We also had to liaise with the Judicial Service of Ghana to recruit and assist with the training of some 1,500 Ghanaians to serve as commissioners for oaths to facilitate the vouching of Ghanaians who lack their primary identity cards for getting onto the database. That is a birth certificate or a valid Ghanaian passport. We recruited and trained over 7,000 temporary, over 70,000 temporary staff for the field work, the mass registration exercise. And uh, we executed a public-private partnership agreement with Identity Management Systems Too Limited, the technical partners of NIA on the 16th of April, 2018. In addition to the foregoing, we also had to fulfill a number of conditions precedent for the implementation of the National Identity System Project. And all of these came to an end on the 25th of March, 2019. So the roadmap, next slide please. The roadmap to achieving excellence then consisted in the following, in broad strokes. The piloting of the mass registration exercise in the greater Accra region of Ghana from June 4, 2018 to 28 April, 2019. We then had to conduct a mass registration exercise from 29th April, 2019 to 21st March, 2020. In the third place, we conducted an expedited card issuance and MOPAT registration exercise. And that took place on the 10th of June, 2020, between the 10th of June, 2020 and the 11th of September, 2020, when the COVID-19 situation in Ghana has somewhat abated. We also, between the 1st of July, 2020 and now, have undertaken institutional registration and household registration. Institutional registration means that 
institutions that wish for and for the National Education Authority to visit their premises to register their members or their staff can request us to do so at a fee of 100 Ghana CDs per person. Household registration um, means that any household with membership of about five persons or more can request NIA to come to the home and register those persons at a fee of 150 Ghana cities. In either instance, they also pay for the cost of transportation from our, the nominal cost from our head office to wherever the institution or the home is located. We've also, between the 4th of January and now, 4th of January 2021 and now, uh, implemented a verification platform and data integration system that has enabled us to um, integrate data with a number of institutions that our law describes as user agencies, including most notably the National Health Insurance Authority, the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, the Controller and Accountant General, and the Ghana Revenue Authority, among others. Finally, from 1st of June to now, we have established regional and district offices, and we have recruited a total of 1,326 persons as permanent staff. And effective the 3rd of November, that is exactly a week from today, we shall roll out the implementation of these permanent national and regional and district offices. Altogether, there will be 291 offices to be open by the 3rd of November. Next slide, please. So, to be successful, you need a cooperation of a number of persons and institutions. Our success has depended largely on the buy-ins that we secured. Notable among them is the support from His Excellency, the President of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, the Vice President, Dr. Mahamud Baumia, and the Minister responsible for the National Identification System, the Minister also responsible for monitoring and evaluation, then Honorable Dr. Anthony Akutu Osei. We've enjoyed support from key influencers in Ghanaian society, including former President J.A. Kufour and the late President Jerry John Rollins, as well as former President John Dramani Mahama, the Otumfo Osei Tutu II, the King of Asante, the Asantehene, and the Parliament of Ghana, the Judicial Service of Ghana, and the National House of Chiefs, and the Council of State, among others. We've also been successful because We've enjoyed a passionate and enthusiastic support of the thousands of staff of NIA who worked on a temporary basis to make this exercise smooth and effective. The readiness of most Ghanaians to acquire the Ghana card and to go through the fatigue of doing so has also been a cornerstone of our success. Finally, we've enjoyed support from all the various political parties and civil society organizations that are key players in Ghanaian society. Next slide, please. So all of the foregoing can be summed up in the following key achievements. First, we exceeded the mass registration targets set for us by the governing board of the National Identification Authority. The target of 80% was exceeded when we reached a target of when we actually achieved a registration figure of 83.4%, uh, 84.3%, I'm sorry. Then we've also printed over 80% of the cards instantly. And it is um, a remarkable achievement that cards were being printed at thousands of registration sites across uh, the country at the same time, simultaneously. We employed over 76,000 field officials and we trained and deployed over 2,000 commissioners for OOPS for the first time in the history of this country, having a significant injection of technical personnel able to assist in the legal documentation verification processes. We shared biometric data sets with the National Health Insurance Authority, the Social Security and National 
Insurance Trust, the Ghana Revenue Authority, and the Controller and Accountant General. All of them impacting significantly on the operations of these various uh, statutory bodies. In the process of our work, we also stopped some 3,811 foreigners from fraudulently registering onto the National Identity Register as Ghanaians when they hadn't gone through the legitimate processes. We naturally encountered some challenges. The major challenges that we encountered included most notably the impact of COVID-19 pandemic that caused a stall in our operations. We had to truncate our activities um, on the 20th of March, 2020, just about a week shy of our completing date, completion date. There was also, of course, a misuse of social media to provide false information that sometimes created confusion for some uh, sections of the citizenry. There was poor network connectivity in some of the rural and urban areas that also posed a major challenge to the efficacy of the card printing process. The deployment of registration equipment and officials across the riverine areas, the difficult mountainous areas and water bodies was a major challenge, but we overcame all of those. There was sadly needless partisanship, needless politicization of the registration process that also um, somehow poisoned the work environment. But again, all of these were um, overcome with tact and diplomacy as was necessary. Next slide, please. The registration statistics that I shared earlier um, indicate that the target was 18.453 million, 124, and we achieved 15 million, 663,585. That constitutes a percentage of I mean, it constitutes 84.88%. We printed 15,581,283 cards. That was, uh, sorry, that was our target. And we have actually printed 15,564,490. That represents 99.89% of the target achieved. Our object was also to issue 15,562,413 cards. In reality, we achieved the goal or the target of 14,056,768. That represents 90.33% of the target. As of 1st October 2021, we have achieved 84.88% of the enrollment target and thereby exceeding the target that was set for us in the of 80% in the registration of persons aged 15 and above. Next slide, please. There are a number of potential benefits, potential benefits of the National Identity Register database. Permit me to highlight a couple of them. First, it will assist in the elimination of cost and fatigue of periodic citizen registration in different data silos. Notably, for example, the periodic registration for voter ID cards. Second, the issuance of secure, reliable smart ID cards with a 10 year life cycle to enhance identification, policy planning and national development. Third, the elimination of concerns of identity fraud due to the high integrity of the national identity register database that we have established. So we're going to be able to ensure that there is non-duplication of identities in different data silos that will eliminate doubts and controversies about the eligibility of persons for various services and facilities, including the determination of citizenship and age. And finally, we will be able to enhance the inclusiveness, social, economic, and other forms of inclusiveness in our society due to the fast, accurate enrollment and verification that we provide. Online and offline verification processes, fingerprint, 
facial and iris. Um, the iris system is yet to be activated based on need, but iris verification is available. And successful verification with or without Ghana card being present. We have a one-off registration for Ghana card, which ensures eligibility for various services. One of the reasons that Ghana card has been successful is the drive of Ghanaians to go for it, to go and register for the card. And it is also because Ghanaians appreciate that there are about 17 mandatory users of the Ghana card, 17 things that cannot be done if a person doesn't have the Ghana card. Next slide, please. So in Ghana, you cannot, when the law is fully enforced, you cannot apply for and be issued with a passport without a Ghana card. That is already the case. You cannot apply for and be issued with a driver's license or to purchase an insurance policy. That is already the case. You cannot engage in banking transactions without a Ghana card. You cannot purchase, transfer, and register title in land without the Ghana card. You cannot register to vote. You cannot pay your taxes and you cannot register your SIM card for your telephone, mobile phone. Application for various public or governmental services, facilities and approvals, permissions and benefits that are ordinarily customary available to the public will not be available to persons who do not have the Ghana card. And any other transaction which the National Identification Authority may determine and publish in the Gazette. Other institutions that are to be um, onboarded in the data sharing or data integration and harmonization process include the Land Commission of Ghana, the National Service Secretariat, and the Student Loan Scheme. When all of these are onboarded, it means that their services will be out of bounds to persons who do not have the Ghana card. We are in the process of harmonizing and integrating our data with various institutions. We have to date integrated data with the National Health Insurance Authority, the Ghana Revenue Authority, the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, and the Control and Accountant General's Department, as I indicated earlier. We are in the process of getting the banks, the financial institutions, and the tele telecommunications companies to come on board. Ongoing engagements and discussions to do so with the Electoral Commission, the Best and Death Registry, and the Ghana Immigration Service, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration are at various stages of advancement. Next slide, please. I indicated earlier that we are in the process of establishing permanent regional and district offices, and that these will come on board on the 3rd of November, 2021. These offices will provide services in the nature of registration of all citizens from a zero to infinity free of charge. They will also issue cards of Ghanaians that have not that have been printed but not have but not yet issued to them. Applicants whose cards have not yet been issued to them will have an opportunity to collect the cards in the communities in which they registered. The permanent offices will also register all foreigners who are legally and permanently resident in Ghana at a fee in the communities in which they live. They do not need to travel to Accra for that, the national capital for that service. The office will also provide service in the nature of replacement of lost cards, stolen cards, damaged cards, or defaced cards at a fee. And finally, persons who seek to update their personal records in the National Identity Register will be able to do so free of charge. The NIA 
will commence the registration of children below the age of 15, 15 years, because we, we limited the registration exercise, the mass registration exercise to Ghanaians aged 15 and above. We will also commence the registration of Ghanaians in the diaspora um, in the very near future. I thank you very much for your kind attention and we want to questions and comments. Yes, Adelaide. thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful presentation. You've definitely made huge, huge progress and to and put the identity ecosystem of Ghana on a sure footing. Um, there are a lot of questions. A couple of questions seem to uh, revolve around the issue of how did you detect um, the 3,800 imposters that wanted to be, was it through deduplication? Could you explain the process and what was the procedure after you detected? How did you deal with that? Well, thank you very much. Um, before I answer that question, let me say that I'm with two of my colleagues. Um, I have with me Mr. Frank Oye to my left. He is Executive Director of Identity Management Systems 2 Limited, the technical partner of NIA. Mm -hmm. And also I have Ms. Teresa Esson Benjamin. She is my executive assistant at the National Education Authority. As and when appropriate, either of them may assist me in answering the questions. Now, how did we detect the uh, three, over 3,000 persons who um, sought to fraudulently acquire the Ghana cards? I indicated earlier that we recruited and trained a large number of persons. They were given training in citizenship, in the citizenship laws of Ghana. They were given training in the identification, ocular inspection and identification, identification of um, genuine documents, how to distinguish a genuine birth certificate from a fake birth certificate, a genuine passport from a fake one. And the, we also had so a number of uh, persons trained as commissioners for oaths. And at every registration center, there was at least one commissioner for oaths who had to vouch for the, uh, who had to officiate the process of an individual vouching for the identity of a person as a Ghanaian. The interrogation process that um, the registration officials and the commissioner for oaths um, uh, that they uh, uh, um, implemented at the registration center ensured that those who were lying were by and large caught red-handed. Sometimes people would escape, I mean, find a way to um, escape arrest because they realize that they are just about to be um, arrested. But all of these were civil procedures. They, they, they were not um, um, struggles. There were no um, aggressive handling of anybody, just the mode of interrogation and the questioning of the documentation that were um, presented. But my colleagues may want to add, add to it. Um, yes, Frank, we also had um, some formatting um, agreements with our best and best um, um, agency. Western documents that were presented were actually uh, checked against the, uh, the known format. And when there was a deviation, of course, they would know that the document was a counterfeit. So okay. that's one of the things we actually put in place to make sure we actually could authenticate paper-based uh, documents that came for the registration. Okay. Actually, yes, one, one more point from Theresa, yeah. please. Hello. Yes, so there was also, the, from the technical perspective, there was the, the system is designed to do deduplication right. and it's real time. So if you attended a, um, a registration center and you had registered in the past with NIE as a foreigner, your database or the data was sort of put together with the current mm -hmm. registration that we undertook. And for that reason, if you had registered before and you, you put, we took your biometrics, the system would automatically do the deduplication and then it will indicate that you're already in the database as a foreigner. And then you, your, your details are put into a separate registration queue and um, we take it from them from a legal perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor, 
there's a lot of interest on understanding how authentication is done for ser- at the point of service. Are fingerprints being stored on the card? Are they being used to authenticate at the point of service? Or that has not yet happened? Yes, um, thank you very much. That has already happened. The okay. fingerprints, the uh, APHIS, the facial, and the iris that are captured are stored on the chip that is embedded on the card. And so all of that information is readily available in addition to the the key uh, biographic data of of the individual. And so um, through the verification system, uh, it comes up if the uh, card is administered onto a surface of a reader or because a card is contact and contactless, that um, is easily determined. Mr. Oye is here and will make a contribution to that. Okay, um, the card has um, what we call the match on card profile mm-hmm. uh, um, and also the EID profile. So we stored some of the biometrics in the card. Um, we have a 120 AK chip which stores on the card um, so that we can do both online and offline verification. So in cases where we need to authenticate uh, identity offline, we then use a batch on card profile, the card, to use that to verify the identity of the person. So all you do is just put a fingerprint on the device and then to read out the card. In cases where you also need to do online, then we go to the, to the regulation platform and do a live connection. You can do either a one-to-one verification if you have your unique ID with you, you can do I want to make where the card of person. So just put all your fingerprints on there and to pick up your unique um, identity. Okay. And and if there is a failure, uh, is there a backup if you have a protocol for exception handling when the authentication fails? Yes, we have um, a backup. Um, we actually saw the backup, which is for a, a, for a failure one. So as soon as one the thing goes down, it reverts knowledge to the next one. So there's always continuity in service. Okay, but if the biometric fails, um, what is the operator told to do at the point of service if their biometric one-to-one does not work? We have um, a multimodal biometric um, approach. So okay. we use facial and also fingerprints. Um, so we will use facial if finger fails. Absolutely. So if you have a challenge with your, with your, with your, with your what you call it, okay. biometric, and we actually would take down the facial as well. I understand. Another and question. there's a case where um, you need to escalate. They will send you to NIA, and then we'll go through um, a further um, investigation um, at NIA. Right, okay. Uh, Professor, just quickly, um, there is, a, uh, we understand there is a current SIM re- re-registration exercise going on in Ghana. Somebody's asking about this. They're saying, is it aimed at testing the Ghana card authentication element of the system? Um, since the, the card is the single point of truth, what is the objective of the re-registration of the SIM? Excuse me. Um, as I understand it, the object of the SIM registration is to ensure that every SIM is linked to a specific human being. And that specific human being must be in the NIA database. Our law requires that before a person gets or registers a SIM card in their name, that person must have the Ghana card. So the integration will ensure that real human beings are linked to each single SIM card. And it will help with all the general purposes that are connected with knowing who is using what uh, SIM card. Uh, it will help us to control SIM card related fraud and all kinds of crimes, uh, telephony related uh, crimes. Right. Okay. Um, there are quite a few questions that are online. So I, w- I would ask the NIA, um, uh, NIS group to, uh, to answer them if possible offline. Uh, however, there is uh, also interest in bringing in a community voice operator. Um, do we have a community voice? Um, on, or if not, uh, we can answer some of the questions. Um, Also, basically, um, I want to comment about the example that that you have used uh, to promote uh, and and 
do outreach and awareness building within within Ghana. They are, it attracted the international community, and I think it's it's a best case example of of how citizen engagement needs to work. If you care to, uh, in a few um, closing remarks, to to mention how important it was this campaign. Did you utilize communication groups? Did you? How did you construct this campaign? Well, thank you very much. Um, one of the key, um, one of the major things we did with mass the engagement with the public was the use of key influences in Ghanaian society. We commenced with the registration of um, former presidents. We had three former living presidents at the time, and each of them had a big constituency of following. Their buy-in was significant. We also registered members of the National House of Chiefs. Traditional authorities um, are very important in Ghanaian society. The registration of the Asantehene and the uh, Togbe Afede and, and some of these big chiefs were very significant. I mean, very, very significant. That was one. Then the institutional registrations. When we registered members of parliament, members of the judicial service and the, the, the council of state, which is the advisory body to the, the, the president. When we registered members of the executive and the ministers and the security sector, it ensured that there was broad societal um, um, appreciation of the value at the highest level of the value of the Ghana card. But we also worked with the an institution called the National Commission for civic education. It is a country or constitutional body with a mandate to educate the public. And we worked with the information services department of the Ministry of uh, Information. We also used um, radios, uh, frequency modulated radio stations. And there are over um, a thousand radio, private radio stations in Ghana. We worked with them. And as necessary and appropriate, where we had to beat the gong gong, where we had to use traditional uh, um, methods of communication in the village, um, that with a town crier, we did so. We also worked with the political parties. We engaged them, saw their buy-in, and they also encouraged uh, their supporters to go and register. There was initially some resistance, but by and large, people went for them. And as I indicated earlier, as more and more Ghanaians realized that there were certain mandatory users of the Ghana card and that without the card, they would not be able to access certain services and facilities customarily available to the public. They went um, to register. But public education was key. And mm -hmm. we did at all levels when we went into any community. We did the community entry strategy um, beginning with the traditional authorities, the religious authorities, and the political and administrative leaders of the community. And all of those were very helpful um, um, mechanisms for, for advancing education and acceptance. Okay, wonderful. Unfortunately, we could spend a lot more time with you, but we don't have that time. Uh, there is uh, somebody who would like to join the Community Voices, actually, Mr. Mudasiro Dahiro. Please introduce who you are and state your purpose, please. Welcome. Um, hey, good afternoon. Hey, it's afternoon in Nigeria. Good afternoon. Hey, my name is uh, Mudasiro Dahiro. Uh, I'm working with the Ministry for Road Development. Uh, it's an agency, government agency in Sokoto. Uh, I cannot uh, emphasize, uh, I'm very, very delighted. My joy can maybe emphasize the presentation of Ghanaian. Uh, I can see Ghana has taken all necessary actions or steps towards effective identity. Um, I, I don't know how to express my happiness, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. The question I have for uh, a Ghanaian, how many digits does a Ghanaian card has? That is very important. And the two, and, and I also want to know the status of people who are below 15 years of age on the registration. And these are the two things uh, I would like to ask. But okay. it is a nice, very, 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 very important. And uh, two, looking at the, what happened in India, 
to have effective identity, there is nothing we can do without the enactment of law. Right. And the Ghanaian law is show that, you see the way the Ghanaian started from the president to parliament. And I, I don't know how to express my happiness. And Thank all you. the all the state has been taken towards that. And uh, I would like to know two things. That is one, the status of people who are below 15 years. And the three, two, the, the number, the digit, how, how many number does the Ghanaian card has? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dahil, Mr. Dahil. Uh, Professor, can we just quickly answer those? Uh, you are on mute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, happy that uh, Mr. Tahiru is very pleased with what we've done in Ghana. Thank you very much. Um, the no number of digits that we have on the Ghana card is 13. It's alphanumeric. We capture all 10, I mean, uh, 10 fingers, the space for uh, iris and, and everything else, but it's 13 digits. Um, what is the strategy for registering Ghanaians below age 15? Um, we are, through the permanent regional and district offices that we are establishing effective a week today, we're going to go to the schools, the kindergartens, the chip compounds, the maternity wards, wherever the younger Ghanaians are congregated, we will go there and register them. The strategy was to register persons 15 years and above, believing that they would make the most economical use of the cards. Mm -hmm. And the parents and guardians of the children under 15 years would, having, have, having had the Ghana card, would have had the experience of going through the registration process and therefore would be better positioned to assist the children, the teachers, will also be a better uh, position to assist the younger Ghanaians to be, to be registered. So a different registration model, not a mass registration, will be rolled out to take care of Ghanaians under 15, going to the locations where they are commonly found. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And thank you, for everybody on the Ghana team, for this wonderful, wonderful and generous sharing of information. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. As I said, there are lots of questions for you, Professor, but I hope uh, we'll get the chance to answer them. And also in my uh, summary, executive summary that I'll give at the end, I was heavily influenced by many of the ideas that you have um, advocated in your presentation. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, it's our pleasure. Operator, um, could you please bring on the second part of the segment on Ion Africa, where we welcome uh, the Director General Kafana from ONESI, who, which is the identity authority in the Cote d'Ivoire. We are going to have with us an, an, a translator. Um, Mr. Kafana uh, speaks English and French, but he will be giving his presentation in French and the operator will interpret, the interpreter will interpret into English. So um, welcome, welcome Mr. Kafana, and uh, the, the, the forum is yours. You, you are muted. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Attic, for this opportunity. Uh, to share the experience of uh, Ivory Coast uh, in the field of identification. I will just, I will, do, I will go ahead and present the, uh, the uh, uh, let me start over here. There you go. One second. There you go. Alors, donc, euh, donc merci pour cette opportunité. Thank you for this opportunity. De partager donc notre expérience euh, au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire dans, dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre euh, de notre projet d'identification. To share our experience at the Ivory Coast on the identification projects. Alors, ce projet est appelé le projet de mise en œuvre du Registre national des personnes physiques. So this project is called the National Register of Natural Persons. Alors les axes que je vais présenter aujourd'hui euh, 
Les axes majeurs sont euh, déjà la présentation de notre office, de notre agence. The main parts that I will present today is first the presentation of uh, our office, of our agency. Uh, la présentation du projet uh, RNPP. Second, the presentation of the RNPP project. Et puis uh, l'état d'avancement du projet. And then the state of advancement of where is, where are we at in matter of RNPP? Alors, il faut dire que l'office a été créé euh, par un décret euh, en 2019. The ONC was created by a decree in 2019. Avec pour euh, mission principale la mise en œuvre de la politique nationale de l'état civil, de l'identification. With, with main mission, the implementation of the national policy on civil status identification de l'immigration et de l'immigration of immigration and immigration ainsi que la production des titres sécurisés as well of the production of secure documents alors euh, notre office est placé sous la, la tutelle technique du ministère de l'intérieur et de la sécurité our office is placed under the technical supervision of the ministry of interior and security et la tutelle financière du ministère du budget et du portefeuille de l'État. And the financial supervision of the Ministry of Budget and State Portfolio. Alors, qu'est-ce qu que le projet RNPP? So, what is the RNPP project? Il faut dire que cela est parti d'un constat, euh, constat qui a été fait sur le, sur le territoire national depuis euh, des années. It started from an observation that has a very long uh, date, many years ago, on the territory. Et qui a conduit donc à définir des objectifs à l'horizon 2025 pour l'État de Côte d'Ivoire. And which concluded in establishing objectives for 2025 in Ivory Coast. Et donc l'objectif est d'arriver à un système moderne, performant. So a... the The objective is to establish a modern system, performing and reliable. Sécurisé et durable d'identification de l'individu. Secure and durable of people identification. Afin de lui assurer sa sécurité juridique. To ensure the legal security. Et l'exercice de sa citoyenneté. And the exercise of citizenship. Ainsi, donc, le 28 novembre 2018, la Côte d'Ivoire a adopté en Conseil des ministres une communication relative à la stratégie nationale de l'état civil et de l'identification. So, on November 28, 2018, the Ivory Coast has adopted a, con a council of ministries on the communication and relative to the national strategy for civil registry and identification. Et donc, la, les axes majeurs de cette stratégie. So, the main focus of the strategy. C'est la création d'un fichier unique des personnes physiques. Is creating a unique file of natural person. À travers la mise en œuvre d'un projet appelé projet RNPP. Through setting up the project which is called RNPP. Alors, cette stratégie nationale de l'état civil et de l'identification s'articule autour de six axes majeurs. This uh, strategy for civil registry and identification is um, uh, focused around six strategic axes. La réforme, du cadre, la réforme du cadre juridique. The legal frame reform. Le renforcement des capacités. Capacities reinforcement. Euh, L'amélioration des statistiques vitales. Enhancement of the vital statistics. L'appropriation sociale. Uh, social appropriation. Le suivi et évaluation. Follow up and evaluations. Et tout cela à travers donc, le, le fichier unique des populations qui, euh, qui, qui, qui est constitué à travers le registre national des personnes physiques. All of that through the constitution of uh, and the creation of a unique file for natural persons, which is the project of the RNPP. 
Alors, euh, avant de présenter cette slide, il faut dire que dans le cadre de, de la Côte d'Ivoire, le choix qui a été fait est, est, est d'aller sur un modèle PPP. The choice of the Ivory Coast was to go through a PPP project a strategy model. Voilà, donc euh, au travers duquel nous avons donc sélectionné un partenaire technique qui a en charge la mise, la mise en place de toute l'infrastructure physique et technique euh, concernant le RNPP. Through which we have chosen an official partner for offering the solutions, uh, technical uh, solutions for the RNPP. Et l'État de Côte d'Ivoire, à travers l'ONESI, se concentre sur le, les aspects opérationnels et le renforcement des capacités ainsi que le déploiement. The ONESI is focusing on uh, the setting up uh, and the deployment of uh, the, the project. Et donc, euh, donc, notre agence a donc en charge de suivi pour le compte d'État de Côte d'Ivoire de la, la bonne marche de ce registre. So, our agency is making sure, is doing a follow-up to make sure that there is a good a functioning of this registry. Alors, il faut dire que ce registre euh, est composé de trois registres principaux. This registry is made of three main registries. Le registre de l'État civil. The civil registry. Le registre euh, identité, donc euh, avec les données d'identification. The identity registry with identification data. Et le registre des flux migratoires, donc qui concerne donc, tout, tout, tous les flux migratoires aux frontières euh, terrestres, aériennes et maritimes. And the um, migration flows registry, which concerns all the movements through borders, uh, may they be uh, through air, um, uh, land or um, water. Alors, ces, ces trois registres-là centralisent toutes, les, toutes ces données-là à travers une base de données qui est, qui est appelée donc le Registre national des personnes physiques. So, all these uh, databases are centralized in one single uh, database, which is the National Registry for a Natural Person. Et donc, cette base de données concentre toutes les données euh, alphanumériques, biographiques et, biomé et biométriques de tout individu résident ou de passage en Côte d'Ivoire. So this database is uh, uh, combining all the data available in terms of uh, uh, biometrics and data for everyone that is uh, living in uh, Ivory Coast and uh, migrating uh, through Ivory Coast. Et à travers ce registre, là, nous assignons un numéro unique, donc un numéro national d'identification à chaque individu. Through this registry, we attribute a national ID number that is unique to each uh, individual. Alors, ce, ce système a l'avantage de pouvoir améliorer uh, plusieurs services au niveau de, de, de l'État. This service, this database proves to offer several benefits to serv state services. Donc, entre autres, améliorer notre système de protection sociale among which improving the social protection services. Permettre d'améliorer les systèmes de prestations de santé. Uh, better social, um, health services. Uh, sécuriser les transactions financières à travers la lutte contre la fraude sur l'identité. Secure financial transactions and fighting against the fraud of identity. Uh, améliorer la sécurité donc, des titres de transport, comme le permis de conduire. Improving the safety of the transportation titles, including the um, driving licenses. Améliorer le service public en offrant des services uh, sécurisés et innovants aux populations. Improve public services and administrative services, uh, for example, providing digital access to certain services. Uh, assurer un meilleur contrôle des flux migratoires. Have a better control of uh, immigration flows. Améliorer également les, le système éducatif à travers une meilleure traçabilité uh, au niveau scolaire. And as well, improving the education services through a better tracking uh, throughout the education of the individuals. Donc, bien entendu, cela, cela n'est pas exhaustif, mais cela permet de voir un peu comment est-ce que le système 
Euh, le, la, la base de données RNPP améliore donc le, euh, tout, le, tout l'environnement euh, au niveau économique national. Uh, this, these are not the single ones. This is not all, but it shows and gives examples of how it can improve the entire ecosystem of the public services. Alors, comment se fait l'inscription d'un individu uh, dans le registre national des personnes physiques? How works the registration of the individuals in this RNPP? Alors, pour un, pour les nationaux, For the nationals? Cela se fait à travers la, 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 une première demande de carte nationale d'identité. It can be made through a first uh, requirement of national ID cards. Soit par un renouvellement d'un ancien titre d'identité. Through renewal of an old identity title. Uh, également par une déclaration de naissance. And as well by, by a birth declaration. Pour les non-nationaux, for non-nationals, cela peut se faire par une obtention de visa. It can be done through the acquirement of a visa. Par l'émission d'un titre, euh, titre de résident. By uh, furnishing of a residency title. Une première demande de carte de réfugié. A first a request of refugee card. Une déclaration de naissance. A birth declaration. Et également à travers le renouvellement d'un ancien titre euh, de, de, de résident émis avant, le, avant la mise en œuvre du RNPP. And as well by the renewal of old titles that were issued before the existence of the RNPP. Alors, comme il a été mentionné tout à l'heure, euh, le, le RNPP permet à l'État de Côte d'Ivoire d'assigner un numéro unique à chaque individu résident ou de passage en Côte d'Ivoire. So, as it was mentioned before, the RNPP allows to offer a national ID number unique to each person that is either leaving or transiting through the territory. Et à travers ce numéro-là, euh, tout, divers services sont améliorés et, et, des, et, et des populations peuvent très facilement accéder à, à des services. And through this uh, number and the system, the services are improved and people can access it is, uh, more easily. Donc, euh, à titre d'exemple, nous avons donc le, le système bancaire, donc à travers la, la, la traçabilité par, le, par l'émission de ce NNI. As an example, the tracking allows better bank services. La couverture maladie universelle. The national universal health coverage. Les permis de conduire. Uh, driving licenses. Le système éducatif. Educational serv- uh, system. La santé. The health. Sécurité sociale. Social security. Les passeports. Passport. Etc. Etc. Alors, quel est l'état d'avancement du projet RNPP? So, what is the progress state of the RNPP? Il faut dire que cet avancement est, est monitoré à travers six, six, enfin six composantes qui sont le, la, la phase de, de conception et de réalisation. So the status is monitored through six factors, which are the conception and realization. Donc il faut dire qu'au niveau de la conception et de la réalisation, le système d'identité a été déjà livré. So in terms of conception and setup, Uh, it states if the system has been delivered already. Au niveau identité, donc, ce système aujourd'hui produit des cartes d'identité biométriques de dernière génération, euh, similaires à, à la carte justement euh, de, de nos amis du Ghana, donc euh, une carte biométrique euh, sécurisée de dernière génération. Uh, this system allows the furnishing of a national ID card that has biometric data, which is the latest technology, similar to what Ghana is uh, setting up. Uh, également sur le volet état civil. And matter of civil registry. Faut dire que la, le, la constitution du registre uh, état civil est en cours. The civil registry database is being established. À travers un, un projet de modernisation de l'état civil qui consiste à digitaliser 
tout le processus de collecte des données d'État civil et centraliser toutes ces données dans une base centrale. Through a process of digitalizing the registry and including all this database in a centralized, uh, all this information in a centralized database. Alors, il faut dire qu'à travers le projet État civil, la stratégie de la Côte d'Ivoire est de se rapprocher des populations pour collecter les données d'État civil. So, through this strategy of um, uh, registry of the population, the goal is to get closer to all these populations that are uh, being included. Et donc, nous déployons uh, un système qui permet de collecter les données dans les villages, dans les centres de santé uh, et dans les centres d'État civil. En ce qui concerne les naissances, les décès et les différents, les différents faits d'état civil. So we are reaching out to distant populations to be able to register births, uh, deceased uh, certificates and all the civil registry information. Et cela se fait à travers des terminaux mobiles que nous, que nous déployons dans ces différents, euh, différents endroits. And this is made through mobile terminals that are being deployed in different places. Et donc, ces données sont collectées et directement insérées donc, dans, le, dans le registre euh, État civil qui, est, qui centralise toutes les données d'État civil au plan national. So, these data are collected and automatically uh, inserted in this database in a national, national wide. Euh, so, donc, nous passons à une phase, à une phase pilote qui va démarrer dans le mois de novembre. A pilot phase will start in November. Uh, et donc nous pourrons donc uh, déployer progressivement ce dispositif sur tout le territoire national. To be able to deploy progressively this uh, setup in a nation, um, in the range of a nationwide. Au niveau des, des flux migratoires, la conception est en cours. In terms of migratory flows, the conception is being made at the moment. Et cela se fait, cela va, va consister à s'arrimer aux bases de données qui collectent les données lié au flux migratoire. And uh, this uh, will uh, be based on the connection with a migratory flow database. Euh, la quatrième composante ici, qui est le complément au RNPP, consiste à la mise en œuvre de services électroniques. The fourth uh, element is the setup of the uh, electronic, um, combining electronic uh, services. Uh, et dont, dont certains services sont déjà disponibles dans le service d'authentification. So certain of these uh, digital services are already available, including identification. Uh, authentication. Yeah. I'll take, sorry. Okay. Donc au niveau de, le, il y a également la mise en œuvre de l'infrastructure physique, donc le, la construction uh, des sites de production, les sites, princi sites principaux et les sites secondaires. We have as well the setup of the physical infrastructure, which is the uh, factories uh, that are actually producing the, and those are the main production sites and secondary production sites. Uh, également, au niveau du déploiement de, des équipes, nous avons déployé déjà des équipes sur tout le territoire pour la collecte des données. We have uh, deployed teams for in the whole territory for collecting data. Uh, au niveau international, cela va démarrer en début d'année prochaine. And in matters of international data, this will start next year, beginning of next year. Uh, ensuite, nous avons tout ce qui concerne uh, l'exploitation, le maintien et la condition, uh, le, maintien, le maintien en condition et la mise à niveau du système qui est, qui est, qui est, déjà, qui est déjà en cours. In matters of uh, usage, uh, maintenance and uh, updates of all the system that's already in place. Ainsi que l'organisation de tous les moyens techniques et humains euh, qui, est déjà, qui est déjà sur le terrain. And then we have as well the organization of all the technical and human um, um, capacities that is already in the field. Alors le dernier axe concerne donc les, les métriques de contrôle qui sont déjà élaborées et euh, qui, 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 se mettent, qui se mettent en œuvre progressivement en fonction des différentes, des différentes phases de déploiement. The last uh, axis is the metrics of control uh, that uh, is allowing to um, um, improve the services that have been that are being provided. Okay. 
Alors, le macro planning. In matters of macro planning. À niveau du macro planning, il faut dire que le, le projet aujourd'hui a démarré en, de, en 2019 et euh, est prévu de s'achever en, euh, en, en, en fin 2022. The project started in July 2019 and is planned to end end of 2022. Okay. Uh, if you me, I will take seconds. I will come back very I will come back very shortly. You are on slide uh, 14, yes. Okay. Donc, euh, comme je le disais, la fin des travaux de la mise en œuvre du RNPP est prévue pour fin 2022. So, the end of the setup is planned for end of 2022. Alors, pour euh, une petite du cas à nos, à nos services euh, d'authentification. Our identification solutions. Il faut dire que euh, nous avons aujourd'hui sur le marché des produits d'authentification déjà disponibles qui s'appuient donc sur le, le RNPP. The authentication services are already available and are based on the RNPP. Et nous offrons donc aux entreprises publiques et privées des services par uh, authentification par, par un portail web déporté. So we are offering to public and private companies the authentification uh, online, for example. Et également à, à travers des terminaux d'authentification dédiés through terminals that are dedicated to this authentication. Et également par l'intégration par API de, de notre plateforme d'authentification avec divers services, avec diverses, diverses entités comme les banques, les opérateurs, etc. As well as by API integration of several providers such as banks. Alors, il faut dire que dans le cadre donc des... De la, de, du renouvellement des titres ou de la production des, des titres euh, sécurisés. Through the renewal of secure documents or production of new documents. Euh, nous avons donc déployé plusieurs moyens, donc, dans euh, plus de 3000 agents sur le terrain. We have deployed um, a lot of means, such as uh, 3000 agents on the field. Nous avons euh, environ 150 agents euh, qui s'occupent de la certification ou la validation des, do des dossiers en centrale. 150 agents are dedicated to the validation and the verification of the files uh, in the center. Euh, cela bien entendu, les dossiers euh, ayant besoin de validation puisque le système central permet déjà de, de faire des, certaines vérifications et euh, des comparaisons biométriques comme cela se fait dans les, dans les meilleurs normes. So for most of the files, the system is already automatically authenticating and verifying, but uh, there is still a need of agents. Uh, également, uh, entre autres, nous avons déployé plusieurs uh, dispositifs dans des kits, uh, des, des valises d'enrôlement. We have deployed um, suitcases, kits, suitcases for the enrollment. Et des kits euh, type, type POS qui sont des kits que nous utilisons pour euh, enrôler un peu partout dans les supermarchés, dans les, dans les villages, dans les quartiers, etc. Nous nous déployons vraiment partout avec, ces, avec ce deuxième dispositif. And we have as well deployed POS types uh, uh, systems to allow enrollment in supermarkets, for example, or neighborhoods. Uh, ici, vous avez un exemple d'une salle de, de validation, donc une salle qui permet aux agents de pouvoir uh, valider les dossiers qui ont besoin d'être uh, certifiés. Here, we have an example of a validation room with our agents uh, that are validating certain uh, files that have to be manually verified. Uh, parce qu'il faut dire que dans le, dans, le, dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre du RNPP, in the setup of the RNPP, un accent très particulier est mis sur les questions de fraude sur l'identité. A very important highlight is made on the identity fraud. Donc, nous avons un dispositif qui permet donc de faire le contrôle des, des, des certificats de nationalité et des extraits de naissance. 
So we have a display um, system that allows to verify birth and identity of a citizenship. Uh, ensuite, nous avons donc ici une, une image donc une séance de travail avec le partenaire technique dans le cadre de l'installation du dispositif uh, État civil dans le centre d'État civil. Here we have an example of a working session with our technical partner in the setting up of the civil registry. Et uh, ici juste un exemple des opérations terrain que nous menons dans le cadre de l'enrôlement ou la ou la distribution des des cartes nationales d'identité. Here we have an example of the on-field work for the enrollment of the populations or the distribution of the national ID card. Alors, il faut dire qu'un des challenges également en termes d'identification, c'est lorsque nous enrôlons le, les populations, le retrait euh, des cartes est souvent est toute une opération en elle-même parce qu'il faut toucher le maximum de personnes afin que les, ces personnes puissent retirer leurs cartes dans les délais. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is that we should be able to provide enough cards and fast enough so all these populations can obtain their cards uh, within short delays. Et donc pour cela, nous nous déployons euh, au plus près des populations pour leur permettre, pour leur faciliter euh, l'enrôlement et le retrait de leurs cartes. So we deploy the closest possible to the populations to facilitate their enrollment and the furnishing of the cards. Alors en Côte d'Ivoire, les personnes dont les, les titres sont disponibles peuvent les retirer, à, à, sont notifiées par, par SMS. In Ivory Coast, a person of which a card is already available is notified by SMS, by text message. Également, notre call center est mis à contribution pour uh, contacter les pétitionnaires. And we also have a call center to contact uh, the, the individuals. Et il y a également une plateforme de suivi en ligne qui permet aux, aux Ivoiriens de pouvoir savoir à quel, à quel niveau de traitement euh, leur carte, leur carte d'achat d'identité euh, est. Donc, en ligne, ils peuvent vérifier le statut de production des cartes. Uh, we also have a platform where the user can verify online the status of production of their ID card. Voilà un peu ce que j'avais à dire concernant donc, la mise en œuvre du RNPP. So this is more or less what I had to say in matters of setting up of the RNPP. Thank you. Thank you very much for this exhaustive uh, presentation, which shows significant progress. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions to you to ask. I will start with a question that has recurred several times. In all of your presentation, there hasn't been any mention of the elections. So how do you see the election identification process taking place? Okay. Uh... Merci, Dr. Adik. Thank you, Dr. Adik. Uh, en ce qui concerne les élections, uh, in terms of elections, il faut dire que le rôle de, de l'Office à, à ce niveau-là consiste à mettre un, faire le nécessaire pour que les documents de base uh, pour l'inscription sur la liste électorale soient disponibles. The role of the Office has been to make available all the documents to make the election possible. Uh, principalement les documents qui relèvent de nous, c'est-à-dire les cartes nationales d'identité. Mainly the ID cards for us. Et il uh, y a, a d'autres documents qui sont, qui sont possibles d'être utilisés pour l'inscription qui, qui concernent les, qui sont les certificats de nationalité, mais cela relève du ministère de la Justice. And other documents that are proof of identity that can be taken into account in our process, including the uh, national um, registration certificate, which has to do with the uh, Ministry of Justice. So basically, your ID card will be used by the Electoral Commission to constitute. Uh, along with other certificates, along with other documents to constitute the register. It's not that they are going to do biometric involvement from scratch. Is that correct or not? Uh, oui, pour ceux qui ne sont pas encore inscrits sur la liste électorale, il, uh, bien entendu, il y a un processus d'enrôlement de, 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 pour la liste électorale. Uh, mais pour ceux qui ont déjà uh, leur carte nationale d'identité, uh, le, le, le système donc, électoral s'appuie sur nos données. Okay. So for those that um, have already their ID card, 
uh, they can uh, use it because the electoral system is uh, based on the ID registration information, but they can as well uh, come with their um, elect election card, elect electoral card. Okay. Um, another question that seems to be recurring is the question about statelessness. How do Ivor Ivorians who don't have any documentation able to enroll into the national ID system? Alors, euh, comme cela a été mentionné, euh, il, il est possible donc d'être inscrit au registre national des personnes physiques à travers donc, les, la, le volet état civil. Euh, donc, ceux qui n'ont pas, pas encore de carte nationale d'identité, à travers la collecte des données d'état civil, nous en profitons pour les capter dans le dispositif. If they don't have so, any data civil. Oui. My, my, my question, sorry, before Diane, you translate. My question was, if they do not have any record of them in the état civil or they don't have a birth certificate how do you get them into the system alors là le le seul le seul moyen de le faire c'est à travers donc les la captation au niveau des faits d'état civil ou au niveau des des titres d'identité donc euh, lors d'une demande ou euh, par exemple d'un acte de naissance ou euh, de, de déclaration au niveau de l'état civil, nous en profitons pour donc collecter les, les, les données nécessaires et nous les inscrivons dans, 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 le, dans le registre. So the inclusion in the registry can be done through a birth certificate or through another ID document. Uh, il faut dire que je veux dire qu'il y a un projet également qui est uh, qui est en train d'être monté qui concerne donc un projet similaire au projet Adar uh, en Inde qui concerne donc une inscription massive dans le registre national des personnes physiques, et donc d'enrouler le maximum de population euh, euh, également. Uh, we have this goal of registering as, in, as the model of the ADAR um, program in India to register a maximum number of persons, so including uh, the people who are not uh, registered before. In the, birth, in the birth register, so they in can the register. Okay. Uh, so... To I don't need to go to the Ministry of Justice to get a, a judgment for me to be able to be inserted into the civil register and then after that to be inserted into the uh, national population register. Is that correct? No, no, the Ministry of Justice va être impliqué dans le processus pour les nouveaux demandeurs, par exemple, au niveau des titres d'identité. Donc, pour les pers les, ces personnes ont besoin d'un certificat de nationalité produit par le ministère de la Justice, euh, par, par les tribunaux, euh, et, et, et d'un acte de naissance pour pouvoir donc euh, euh, s'enrôler pour un, un titre. Euh, donc nous, nous en profitons non, dans ce processus-là, euh, nous profitons pour vérifier l'authenticité de ces documents euh, avant euh, l'émission du titre en question. Uh, so, yes, the Ministry of Justice will be engaged and uh, it will help to produce the birth certificate and they will have a process of verification in the meantime of all the data. Okay. Um, one last thing it has to do with the interoperability, regional interoperability. Uh, how do you see the ECOWAS card and, and that type of identification scheme in the region working within your vision? Euh, je pense que l'objectif de la mise en œuvre de la carte, euh, appelée carte CDAO, c'était de permettre justement d'améliorer la libre circulation dans l'espace CDAO à, à, à travers l'émission de cette carte-là. Aujourd'hui, nous avons plusieurs pays, dont le Ghana, le Sénégal, la Côte d'Ivoire, etc., qui sont donc euh, déjà en train de produire cette, cette, cette carte de dernière génération. Et étant donné que ces cartes sont des documents de voyage, euh, nous avons une zone, une zone MRZ euh, sur, sur la carte pour un passeport, ce document donc pourra permettre donc facilement de pouvoir identifier les populations euh, qui transitent donc euh, à travers donc les différents espaces euh, et donc euh, cela c'est une avancée notable. Je pense que ça va, ça va vraiment permettre d'améliorer donc les échanges économiques entre les différentes euh, entre les différentes régions et de façon sécurisée. So this card indeed is uh, meant to offer the free circulation of uh, populations and to be able to register this free uh, this, this circulation. It is already set up in countries like uh, Ghana. So it is a similar type of card that uh, is being established and is a traveling document. It is uh, set up to um, made easier the, all the uh, trade 
um, including the, the trade exchanges between countries. And the Avarians today ask for an ECOWAS card issued by ONESI, or this is tomorrow? Uh, oui, aujourd'hui, ces cartes sont déjà produites, si j'ai bien compris la question. Oui. Ces, ces cartes euh, sont déjà produites depuis l'année dernière. Nous avons commencé la production des cartes, cette carte CDAO, et c'est celle-là qui aujourd'hui est sur le marché. Okay. Euh, donc, la so, yes, these cards, CDAO, have been produced already since last year, and they are already on the market. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there are lots of questions that are still on, but we have run out of time. Um, wonderful view of the progress that you've made and we look forward to seeing you again as you continue to move into the future into service delivery via a digital identity so thank you very much um now uh now we are going to move into the last session which is essentially giving you um the audience uh, a summary an executive summary of the eight presentations that we've heard from eight countries what are the lessons that we have learned and I'll do that by sharing with you my presentation. So, okay. So we have together over, over the, in, in the, this say season three, we've gone in and listened to eight countries report at the highest level. We've had director generals and, and people who are assisting them from all over Africa present to us the progress that they have made uh, over the last year or so in the development of their identity ecosystem. And what I'm presenting today to you is the lessons that we've learned based on the insights of these wonderful men and women who came and spent each with us 45 minutes at least giving us their experience. So I thank them for those insights. Uh, my job here is just to synthesize what we've learned so that to make it easier for you, but I encourage you to um, listen and go back and, re and, and watch the episodes in replay. So just so we be on the same page, when, when we're doing the Africa report, which is today, um, we have looked to do eight countries that are sample representatives, meaning they cover a variety of regions in Africa. We've got geographic diversity, we've got east, we've got west, we've got north, we've got south, we've got also um, Francophones, Anglophones. We will be bringing you uh, Portuguese next year, of course. Um, and we have size diversity. Some are very large, some are small. Uh, so the experiences are very, very diverse. And in totality, they represent 420 million of Africa's population. So today's report is going to be significant in the sense that it is representative um, of the conditions that exist in Africa and the challenges and the experiences and the lessons that can be extracted from those experiences. So this is just to give you a uh, context overview of what we've learned. So st start with lesson number one. Lesson number one, one size does not fit all. ID system is never off the shelf. So enter this thinking, uh, I'm gonna have something that's already done. No, eight countries had eight different approaches to identity ecosystem development. The pathway depends on where you're coming from, including your legacy, your capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So come into it thinking that I need to be doing a, a custom job. Many of them had to do significant custom development. Many had built on existing assets and many have spent significant time planning beforehand. So this is time well spent. Uh, many of them put in place steering and technical committees which spent significant time mapping national assets, stakeholder needs, and understanding the problem before crafting specific strategy for the development of their ecosystem. So it's very, very important that you set the right expectations for your politicians, for your public, for your employees, that this is a custom development. We have to tailor it to your fact patterns. Lesson number two. Lesson number two, the National Population Register as a platform. We call it the MPR 2.0. All are building an MPR 2.0. This is a unified view of a person, the single source of truth. It integrates all foundational ID registers. It integrates things like biometric, national ID, civil registration, immigration, and digitized legacy registers. So, so that's one hallmark of it. It integrates all these registers. 
But the second hallmark of it is that it provides authentication services for digital ID in support of other government and private sector systems. So it has two major functionalities. This is a very powerful pillar. It's the number one pillar that's going on in development right now. And, uh, and being a powerful pillar, it, it is the result of the aggregation and centralization of data. It creates major risks, cybersecurity, privacy invasion, profiling, abuse by government actors, function creeps. It is not simple to actually protect NPR as a powerful tool. This is something we need to pay a lot of attention to. Also, the centralization of this type of data is going to lead to the emergence of the public demanding to know what is stored in those databases about them. So it, it requires you to do something very, very specific. So because NPR 2.0 creates major, major uh, issues and risks. We are crafting the Dark Side of Identity, a thematic series of three episodes, which kicks off on November 17. We continue with December 1st and then December 15 to try to understand how to address the risks that are emerging because the most important pillar of identity development in Africa today is the NPR 2.0, and it's leading to some extended and extra concerns. So you want to be with us in this discussion because our purpose is not to build things that are risky, not to build things that could threaten rights, but in fact to mitigate those risks and only to empower people to do things in their life and to stimulate economic development. So number three, NPR is the foundation of the government stack. So What's happening is that it's not just identity that's going on right now in Africa. Many, many things are happening. Sectoral reform, modernization. You've got digital transformation, e-services. You've got um, payments are being digitized, so on and so forth. All of these things are now converging. And it's not just the uh, identity authorities that are being tasked to do things. Many, many agencies, many, many ministries. So what this is doing is that it's leading to the development of a foundational platform anchored on the NPR, but with a scope that goes beyond the digital identity. This is what we call the government stack. And we've treated the subject in, to the point segment in the episode 20, so I, I encourage you to watch it. This is a very, very important development because all governance in the future is gonna be built on government stacks. At the heart of it, at the most fundamental uh, point of it, is the digital identity, of course, but it goes way beyond that. So you've got to think about government stack when you think about identity. So what is the most important thing in this? Of course, it's the interoperability. Uh, we have to worry about how you build interoperability. Um, we have to do um, technical um, legislative and standardization efforts. These are all non-trivial. So we, we have to develop the capacity and the knowledge for how to do this. Um, the added challenges is that this is not a single uh, operation that's run by a single organization. This is an operation that's run by many, many organizations, so multi-stakeholders. Therefore, it makes its development harder and the adoption non-trivial. The other thing is, since governments are going to be relying on, on this as a critical governance tool and critical infrastructure, you have to build into, into account business continuity and disaster recovery. <clears throat> So um, basically, the development of the government, uh, the Gov stack has now uh, led us, I will be sharing with you a sneak preview today, um, one of the four workshops of the augmented annual general meeting will be on how to develop the government stack. You remember I mentioned in the previous episode that ID for Africa 2022 will be augmented and we will have a physical meeting on the 15th and 16th of June in Marrakesh, Morocco, followed by a virtual meeting on the 28th and 30th of June. And so basically on the 16th of June, we will be running four workshops. And here's a sneak preview. I'm sharing with you that one of the workshops is going to be about how do you build a responsible government stack on based on identity and NPR 2.0. So you definitely want to stay tuned and be part of this um, uh, workshop and, and the discussions and the results that come up from it. Okay, so number four, I said N NPR 2.0 raises a lot of concerns. It's a powerful 
platform and it has a lot of concerns that it evokes. Therefore, a lot of agencies, a lot of identity authorities are putting in place what's called the citizen portal uh, in, in, in order to address and deal with some of the issues that the MPR 2.0 evokes. Here, we believe it's very important for uh, the citizen portal to incorporate things like active notification, which means instead of letting the citizen go to the portal and see who and what has happened to their data, what's in the portal, what's in the database about them, if your data is being accessed, uh, we should be notifying them, saying, by the way, your data is being accessed. Um, and we should also use the citizen portal to provide consent mechanism. You can, you can grant and evoke consent um, and also giving access to third party. If you want to give access to your doctor, for example, or to an insurance company for a limited time and purpose. This is a very, very powerful development. We expect the citizen portal to become an important pillar. I would call this is the, the two and a half pillar. The first pillar is the NPR. I will tell you what the second pillar is, but the citizen portal will be the two and a half pillar or even the third pillar. And it's a must for enhancing population trust and confidence in the system. Okay, let's move to the fifth. The fifth, this is the second pillar, the credential, the proof, official proof of identity. We have one unique identity in NPR, but should expect that there will be a diverse set of credentials. You can carry them on polycarbonate, PVC, a physical card. You can carry them coded on a QRC code with cheap support. You can carry it on your mobile phone. You can put it on the cloud, purely digital. So we've seen all of these in the eight countries that have reported. We expect that to continue to grow, the diversity to continue to be richer, in addition to the functional IDs that continue to coexist. Uh, here, uh, I will emphasize that while the world is moving digital, the physical credential remains important in Africa. And as I said, it's the second pillar after the NPR. Often it is branded, like we've heard today, the Ghana card. Um, but I have to tell you, it is not saying that the world is moving digital while Africa is still maintaining a physical uh, material uh, identity document. That is not going backwards. And there is a reason for this. The reason is concerns about privacy and security issues resulting from centralized registers may push back for offline digital credentials instead of always going to the central database. Even developed countries, in my expectation, will go back to offline uh, digital credentials or offline authentication mechanisms in order to deal with this challenge of privacy. So don't think that Africa is being left behind. If anything, the world is going to go back to the Africa model, in my opinion. Number six. Number six, we've seen extra sensitivity being paid to sovereignty. Um, the authorities want to maintain flexibility and control throughout the lifetime of their system. They don't want vendor. They don't want technology lock-in. And to do that, they are implementing several elements. We call them sovereignty by design components. You can do open source, you can do open standards, you can do modular architecture, and also pro-sovereignty procurement, PSP. Um, so we've seen all of those, and we've, we've go back to the episodes and watch because we've treated many of them um, in, in more detail in previous episodes. Um, but one consequence of sovereignty that has become clear is that you cannot achieve sovereignty without adequate local capacity. So if we say sovereignty, we also have to deal with capacity. So that's the seventh point that I can raise, which is capacity, let me be clear what I mean by that. You need developmental and operational capacity for homegrown solutions, customization, upgrade, operations, and maintenance. I'm not talking about capacity from enrollment. Enrollment agents, not a problem. You've seen, uh, both today Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, just like the other six, have been able to recruit enrollment agents in the thousands. In fact, Ghana reached 76,000 agents. That's not the problem. The problem is we need people who are able to develop solutions, integrate solutions, upgrade, etc. And so clearly the human resources are finally getting attention. The importance of human resources getting attention. Unfortunately, capacity building tools are still 
inadequate in Africa. And that's an area we need to pay attention to. That's actually one of the motivations why ID for Africa was formed as a capacity building institution and organization. So what is required? What is required is not simple. We've got a five uh, element plan. We have to insist on ongoing education and training as national policy and priority. We have to start with the tone at the top. The policy has to come from the leadership of the country to say, we want to educate our people. Second, we want to have sustainable investments in institutions, the universities, um, training uh, schools, whatever. And then we also have to put in place incentives for attracting and rewarding excellence. You have to compete against the private sector. And, and in fact, the private sector will be draining you because they will, um, uh, they will attract through better pay, better working conditions, better advancements. So that's the brain drain problem. So we have to figure out a way to solve the brain drain. And then one important thing that I want to remind you about is that we need to put in place a national strategy for attracting capacity back from the diaspora. Uh, Africa has a lot of people who are outside Africa who are in positions of having achieved high degrees of, of uh, competence. They work in Europe, they work in the United States, um, and they are in a position, if they could come back to their country, to boost uh, the capacity of their country. So let's focus on, on that as a potential avenue. Um, number eight, and we've seen this very, very nicely today, the outreach and communication. We're seeing ID authorities engaging in outreach and dialogue from the start, but also on an ongoing basis. Uh, so you outline your strategy and then you invite the community to comment before you, the launch. It was so heartening to see uh, South Africa process generated over 400 engagements and to see them take the time to go and respond to all the engagement, learn from it and modify their strategy. The goal of the communication and outreach, obviously five things, transparency and trust building. You have nothing to hide. You wanna do the right thing. You wanna also capture actual needs. Sometimes you may not have been aware of these issues. So let the community that you're trying to serve tell you what their needs are. You also wanna overcome resistance. If you communicate about something, it will help make change management easier. You also want to combat false information from social media and or also avoid litigation down the line. Um, when we saw today uh, Ghana, Ghana had a fantastic campaign, fantastic campaign uh, for basically um, outreach and media. So, so be look at that as a model to, to, to emulate. What's required is that you have to build strong communication, but one size doesn't fit all again. You need, in fact, three strong groups to communicate with three different stakeholders. You need community uh, and civil society communication group. You want also another group that can speak to government and partner agencies. You want to also talk to the private sector. Those require different communication skills. It's not just about uh, speaking in, in simple terms. Sometimes you have to speak in technical terms. So be aware of the importance of building your strong communication and have it be anchored on, on multiple pillars. We see three pillars necessary. All of them have it. Number nine, the political will and the buy-in. I mean, I don't need to tell you this. It's critical for success. All had it to varying degrees. Uh, we've seen today in Ghana, for example, the explicit support of the president, the prime minister, but also the parliament before the project is launched. And equally important is the buy-in from the political parties, civil society, and the general population. You cannot think that you have the empowerment and the right to do what you want to do. You need to be reaching out and getting all of the influencers and those who can matter in your country, bless you and give you their buy-in as you proceed. And for that, um, there is a downside to political will. Uh, basically make sure that the political will does not make the identity project political. Uh, this is not about making the project the pet project of a president or the pet project of a political party. Uh, we need sustainability in the political will, not a one-time campaign motivated by political expediency. And you also need to make sure that resilience is being built in this to political instabilities. They are rising on the continent. From time to time, we see political regimes changing sometimes peacefully, sometimes violently. The ID project 
has to build, has to walk that fine line of building the political will, but not becoming political. Okay, so this is an important point, and I think we're gonna we're going to continue to monitor it and keep an eye on it. Uh, number ten. Here, I would say the demand drivers. There is no place on earth where the demand for identity could be higher than it is in Africa. There are so many demand drivers, and every day we're hearing about new applications that are of interest for the African populations. So. There is no shortage. There is no shortage. We've heard today, we've heard from Nigeria, we've heard from many of the uh, eight uh, countries that you, you, if you want a passport, you need an ID card, you need an ID number. If you want SIM registration, if you want to open up a bank account, if you want pensions and insurance policies, um, everything. In fact, Ghana has 17 mandatory uses. I lost track um, of the others, but, but I counted on Ghana and I saw 17 on that, on that screen. So uh, the situation is, is very similar. And it, it runs into sectors. I mean, financial services is the biggest sector. You have inclusion, credit assessment. Credit is very important for economies. Digital payments is very important for economies. Compliance is very important. Anti-money laundering and know your customer. So that's one of the most important sectors that are driving demand across the continent. There's also social protection and safety net. We have seen uh, social uh, needs especially in times of COVID and how important it is to do cash transfers for those who need it most. Um, another sector is the national security, uh, ID fraud and crime. Those are partners in the ID and they are driving it forward. The health sector also, the e-government and e-commerce. So all of those sectors are demand drivers and the list of mandatory uses of ID is going to be continuing to grow because as they rely on the ID, they will be starting to require it more and more. From our opinion, there is a risk here which we have to be worried about, which is the risk of exclusion. If, if access barriers are not removed and if authentication failure is not adequately addressed. We talked about authentication failures in the to the point segment with Alan Gelt today. So you can see if you have an ID system that is mandated, that's required, and you don't uh, address the access and remove the failures of authentication, you may create exclusion. And that's a very, very serious issue. We're going to be monitoring the exclusion risk for all ID systems in Africa. And that's part of what uh, the first episode of, of the dark side of identity will tackle on November 17th. So we don't like mandating ID, actually. We, we It can cause resistance because people view it as penalty. What we like to do is we like to build incentives, uh, basically create new applications, solve a critical problem, and then people would flock to the ID, would say, I want it because I want to be doing something that is easier and that's better in my life. Um, but clearly, this is a matter of, of a fine line to, to walk between mandating and between incentivizing, which we will be addressing in November 17. Now, number 11, financing. That's always a tricky issue. Financing, um, clearly, good ID systems are costly. They require funding. The question is, where does it come from? And in the eight countries that we have seen, these came from multiple sources or diverse sources. Um, the government budget was the majority of them, South Africa, Kenya, Lesotho, Rwanda. Um, it could come from a loan from a development agency, such as Nigeria and Morocco or it could come from a private-public partnership or build, operate, transfer, such as Ghana and the Cote d'Ivoire. We've also seen that many of the ID authorities are beginning to generate service fees, either through card replacement, authentication service fees, or issuing specialized cards like the ECOWAS card, et cetera. Those generate money and, fee and income to the agency, to the authority, which can help subsidize the identity enrollment to the rest of the population, which we strongly believe should remain free of charge. And of course, the hybrid model, uh, you have to do a, a market and ROI study to decide which one fits your fact patterns best. You need a business plan before you decide on how to finance. Uh, each one of these options has an up and down, but done right, ID systems should save government money. And therefore we should do an ROI study and, and make the case for ID systems. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, a country may only need seed 
money as loans. You may not, if a project costs $500 million, you may only need 50 or 100 million to get it started. And the rest could be obtained from the uh, savings that you can, you can achieve or, or the fraud reduction, et cetera. I want to give you an example of a self-sustaining identity authority, Nadra Pakistan, which we have featured in our livecast episode 21 to the point segment. This is a model of where an identity authority can deliver all of the services for the mainstream people, the, um, the basic services free of charge by creating other high value services. So please watch that episode. It has a lot of lessons how to do it. Number 12. Legal frameworks. Um, attention is being paid to legal frameworks. It was very, very uh, nice to see that Morocco did not write a single line of code until legal framework was adopted. Um, I can say to you that all of the eight reporting countries had new laws. As a consequence, we're now dealing with complex landscape, um, reform of old legislation, adopting of new laws. So we need to study these laws. We need to understand what can be done, what cannot be done. We need new expertise and new academic research to go in and examine the legal uh, landscape. It is definitely getting richer and more complex. Now, I think it's very important that we focus on, on making sure as we examine these uh, legislations that, we, that they have rights-based and data-centric based um, so that the MPR framework um, is not focusing on giving the government the right, but actually protecting people's rights. Uh, this takes time to develop. In some cases, we may have to reiterate. But I can tell you, so do court cases, which can delay and rescope the project. Happened in Kenya, happened in India. Um, other thing is, uh, you need data protection and privacy laws must be in place before you roll out to build credibility and trust. So this is a very important area, and we encourage scholars to continue to work with the identity stakeholders to try to harmonize what the legal framework should look like. Here we see um, the data protection legislation status in the eight reporting countries. I'm very pleased to tell you that out of the eight, six have already fully adopted um, the, the legislation and the law. Two, by the end of this year, will also have had adopted. Uh, Rwanda has the bill approved the 6th of May, but needs further review. Uh, Nigeria will be presenting before the end of 2021. So we can say by the end of 2021, all of those countries would have had legislation uh, about data protection. What about enforcement? I would say five um, out of the eight have already begun enforcement. Some have begun enforcement even as, as, as recently as 1st of July, 2021, even though, for example, South Africa had adopted the data protection legislation in 2013. So sometimes putting together the, the, the legislation is one thing, but building the right mechanisms for enforcement is another. So we have to pay attention to both. It's not enough to have law on book, on book, on the books, but it has to also be enforceable. Right? Th number 13. Number 13, what is the institutional framework dominant in Africa? Today, the tendency is to house, house the identity authority in the Ministry of Interior or Digital Transformation. The model of an independent commission is losing ground in Africa. And this saddens me a little bit because I believe we need to revisit this institutional framework. This current tendency has inherent risks. And that's a subject for another day. Um, right now, um, this is mo we're moving in a, in a direction that causes me some concern. Number 14, what about biometrics? Well, biometrics have become universal in Africa. Not only have they become universal, they're also multi-biometric. Nobody's doing a single biometric. You have face and finger dominating. Iris is coming nicely, but still lagging. Uh, contact fingerprints still is the primary, despite COVID. The, the issue of COVID has not killed fingerprints in Africa. Avis has rapidly, is rapidly replacing Avis and strong, strong interest in infant biometrics because they want to enroll as early as possible into the biometric regime. Be careful, biometrics for identification is not the same as biometric for authentication. So requirements are different. Pay attention to image quality as you capture um, the, the samples, biometric samples. We talked about this with uh, the two point session with Alan today, it imp imp impacts performance. You have to also be standards-based if you want standards based, if you want to be interoperable with other systems in the future. 
and one appeal that Africa, the idea for Africa is making to all the identity stakeholders in Africa, resist policy makers' temptation to add DNA. We do not consider DNA as a biometric, and we could go through this discussion in a lengthy manner, but even beyond the ethical dimension that is raised by DNA, we don't think DNA performs or behaves in the same manner as biometrics do. So let us not model the discussion by adding DNA to the list of biometrics. Um, what about the legal age for ID? You've heard today uh, it's coming down. It's coming down um, in South Africa, it's 10 years. In Ghana, it's 15. Everybody is also trying to reduce it. In our opinion, this is a moot point. Uh, if well integrated with the civil register or the national population register, digital identity should be attributed at birth. You should get your ID number when you are entering this world. However, there's another milestone, which is when you become at a certain age, a reasonable age, you enter the biometric regime. We call it the entry into the biometric identity regime. You can set it at a reasonable age. India has set it at five. Um, South Africa wants to set it at 10. Ghana wants to set it at 15. It's a question of technology feasibility and capacity issue. Number 16, what about onboarding and enrollment? You have heard a lot of talks in the eight presentation, present, presenting countries that enrollments are progressing very well across the continent with a commitment to no one left behind. Uh, we are reaching effectively saturation in many countries in adult registration, except Nigeria. Nigeria's got some ways to go. They have a much, much larger population, of course, but they've reached over 64 million registered individuals. And then Morocco has not begun registration into the national population register. The roadmap is now oriented towards children, diaspora, and also going to vulnerable groups, um, individuals who are unable to show up to the office because of physical disabilities or because of certain minority status that they are, have concerns and they are not being communicated to the right way. Um, the means to do that, we're seeing every mean, mop-up campaigns, continuous registration, um, targeted campaigns where you're going into institutions, um, to the schools, to the enterprise, mobile enrollment trucks and kids can go there, and also an ecosystem approach where you outsource the enrollment. Um, I would like to emphasize that from our experience, we see data capture as very costly. So you need to implement data minimization. Capture only what is needed for identification. Resist the temptation to capture too much. And also stick with standards-based data capture and using certified devices or else your investment in the enrollment, which is very costly, will have to be redone. Another thing to consider, which is happening in Nigeria, we're excited to see this. This is a pilot that they're doing, uh, which is purely digital, onboarding as an entry point within a risk framework. So you, from your phone, you can use a selfie and you can demand um, a temporary uh, parent ID number or a temporary uh, low security uh, NIN, national identity number, and then you can be given the opportunity later on to go in and enhance the security and get if your fingerprints taken and then give you higher access. So this is very, very important. I think the continent needs to move in digital onboarding. Number 17, and we have only one more point to raise, regional identity interoperability. No one is there yet, but clearly the idea is starting to be discussed. The exceptions are the use of ID for travel. Rwanda and Kenya, for example, talked about that. And then, of course, you've heard about the ECOWAS card. So the topic generally is being pushed by international development agencies. It's not being generated by the countries themselves at this stage in time. However, prepare for regional and continental frameworks for interoperability and trust. They are happening. They're going to arrive. But reality, don't expect this to happen overnight. We need to ensure that each country has a robust, inclusive, trustworthy identity system that supports its economic needs before it supports the interoperable economic needs of the continent. It will happen, we've got time to go. Number 18, and that's the last point. The tendency of the national identity number, what about this? Where is the thinking about this? We're seeing that the tendency is to go for a single number for life and for all applications. So single number attributed at birth, retired at death, and that will be used by health, uh, 
be used by uh, banking, finance, uh, social protection, so on and so forth. And that's somewhat troublesome, but there are mitigating measures that are being put in place. Luckily, there's an increased interest in making sure that the number itself uh, does not reveal too much about you. For example, random digits and gender neutral numbers are, are starting to be interesting to, to some of the authorities, even though we still have legacy numbers that code information about your sex, your gender, your location of birth, the date of birth, and all this stuff. Our, our recommendation, of course, is, is to have a random number from which you cannot ascertain anything. This is very, very privacy uh, protecting number. Uh, so now that the, some of the numbers um, are going to be used across multiple sectors and multiple applications, um, it, it, raise, it raises concerns. And as a result, uh, a new measure is being considered, which is the NIN tokenization, the tokenization by the NIN, so that the public does not need to use the same number across different applications. Uh, they can generate a token each time they want to do uh, uh, a transaction. So that's a good thing to keep an eye on. Um, Unfortunately, the simplicity of the single number continues to seduce policymakers and authorities. I encourage you to watch Livecast episode number four almost a year ago. We did it on unique ID numbers, and we did even a poll. And, and the majority said that we are going to go for a sim single number because it was, it was simple. But of course, there are associated concerns, surveillance, profiling, theft and hacking, so all real dangers. Okay, we can spend a lot more time um, learning lessons from, from all these eight countries who I thank for the opportunity to teach our community and share with us valuable lessons. But I'd like you to really go back and watch the episodes. I could only give this sort of uh, an executive summary, but the discussions by the men and women who came in on those eight segments and spent the time with us um, are very deep and very, very pertinent and very useful. So please um, do that. Uh, this concludes uh, the, the executive summary. Um, as you can see, operator, remove the slide. As you can see um, in the chat, as you can see in the chat, we have given you links to the specific episodes that have to do with the different countries in the Ion Africa segments. We also are going to make available to you, since you have stayed with us this far, uh, we're going to give you a link where you can download this executive summary. It should be put in the chat as we speak. So thank you very much for sticking with us for this long. I know this has been uh, an, an incredibly long session, but I hope it was worth it for you. Um, uh, if you missed some parts of it, uh, you came in late, um, you will always find the replay on YouTube. So please continue to engage with us. And we look forward to seeing you on November 17, when we start back the thematics in the sequence of three episodes related to the, the dark side of identity. And all of this has come up um, as a result of the lessons that we've learned from the eight uh, countries that have reported. And you can see the power of, our, of the live cast. So we were we, we did not build the program months and months in advance. We studied the Iron Africa, we understood the lessons, and then we appreciated the dangers and working with the identity authorities and the identity stakeholders and our community, we reached out and we said, we would like to have your ideas about the dark side of identity. And we received an overwhelming number of propositions. And hopefully we are going to bring to you the best minds and the best dialogue on the topic so that we together can arrive at building inclusive and responsible ID system. Until then, we wish you best of luck, stay safe, and see you on November 17th. Thank you.